I mean, we're having a blast talking about asteroids, but everyone else wants to hear about asteroids too. Yeah. All right, we'll give people just a minute to get on. Okay. Yep, we'll give people just a minute to get on. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for all the attendees to join. Um, but very excited for this talk. Brent and I were already having a, a great conversation about asteroids, and uh, and this is a very exciting time for uh, space exploration with Perseverance landing as well. Yeah. All right. Looks like people have started to join now. Um, so uh, just before we started the talk, I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Uh, and I wanted to thank Dr. Brent Boss for, for being here. This is going to be a really fantastic uh, presentation. I, I got to see a preview of it a few months ago. So I'm excited about it too. Um, this is going to be a celebration of Roger Chaffee, a local astronaut uh, who lost his life in the Apollo 1 accident along with Gus Grissom and Ned White. Uh, and so this is our fifth year celebrating uh, Roger that. Uh, and uh, we're, we're doing this in collaboration with GBSU and the Michigan Space Grant Consortium. So we're really excited that we we're all work, able to work together uh, on this conference. And today we have uh, another person who grew up around right around here. Uh, he's from the area and he actually visited the Roger B. Chaffee Planetarium as a kid. And today he's here to give us a, a, a fantastic talk about Osiris Rex, uh, which he was an integral part of. So uh, Brent, Osiris Rex is Brent Boss's fifth planetary mission to successfully leave the Earth's atmosphere. And he started working on Osiris Rex in 2010. He served as Osiris Rex's uh, systems engineer, subject matter expert in optics, and the OSIRIS-REx Visible and Infrared Spectrometer uh, Optics Lead. So in 2015, he also became the TAG CAM, so that's the Touch and Go Camera uh, Instrument Scientist, and he continues in that role today. And then uh, maybe after his presentation, he can talk a little bit about uh, what he's going to be doing in the future, either with OSIRIS-REx or uh, other missions, and so we'd love to hear about that too. All right, uh, well... Uh, are, are you ready to take it away, Brent? I'm ready to go if you guys are ready. Let's do it. All right, let me share my screen here. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, they can uh, type it into the chat. And uh, the the presentation I think will will be done within an hour, and we'll we'll have some time. Uh, uh, Brent Boss said he'd, he'd be happy to stick around for a bit and answer any questions. So there'll be time at the end for that too. All right, can you guys see it now? Yeah, looking great. All right, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for the introduction, Jack, and thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to do this. This has been an exciting mission to share with people, and so I'm really. Uh, Happy to be here today and hopefully you'll find it as interesting, as exciting as I have. And I got a lot to cover. I'll probably go through this way too quickly, but there's just so much interesting things to share. So kind of full speed ahead here. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, first, I'll give you a background on OSIRIS-REx, what the goals of the mission are and why we're flying it in the first place. And then I'll highlight two, from my perspective, the most interesting things and kind of surprises from the mission and things that sort of knocked us off guard and, and really took us by the surprise and just shows you what happens when you have a real mission of discovery and exploration. You're, you're always gonna find surprises. And then I'll end with a quick summary and talk a little bit about what our future plans are. So OSIRIS-REx is an asteroid sample return mission and OSIRIS-REx actually stands for something. It's, a, it's an acronym, a rather tortured acronym, however. Our original uh, lead of the mission really wanted to stick with this Egyptian mythology theme. So OSIRIS-REx stands for uh, Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, that's the last S, that's the S, and Regolith Explorer. So it's a real mouthful. 
Uh, and this was a mission that was proposed many times to headquarters, never quite made it until May of 2011. Headquarters finally granted us uh, funding to implement the mission and to fly it. And our original leader was Mike Drake at the University of Arizona, who was a former professor of mine. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away about five months after we were selected really unexpectedly. Um, but then another University of Arizona person took over. So Arizona is still the lead academic uh, institution uh, with this mission. We launched in September of 2016, and we traveled out to asteroid Bennu, or sometimes I call it 1999 RQ-36. That was its original name. We had a contest back in 2013, a couple of years before launch. Um, and a, I think a nine-year-old ended up winning the contest. And Bennu is also affiliated with Egyptian mythology. So RQ-36 ended up getting renamed Bennu. But we launched um, in September 2016, took about two years to get out to the asteroid. And we got there in October of 2018. We studied the asteroid for about two years. And we believe, as I'll show you, we think we've collected at least 60 grams of material, which was the minimum threshold required from NASA headquarters to consider the mission a success. Um, part of the spacecraft is gonna, all the spacecraft will fly back to earth. And then part of it is gonna actually return to the ground and that's called the sample return capsule that's shown in the lower right here and I'll show you some more of that later. Um, and it returns to Earth in September of 2023, hopefully full of interesting asteroid material to analyze in labs here on the ground. Give you a little idea of the types of things we're talking about here in terms of sizes. So on the upper left hand side, you see an artist rendition, an early rendition actually of what we thought our spacecraft would look like. This was actually in the proposal that we sent to headquarters. And then the lower right, you can see an artist representation of Bennu um, compared to the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So we have a pretty good sized spacecraft, even though it's small when you think about it compared to Bennu, but we're almost seven feet on the side and we're powered uh, electrically using these large solar arrays. So you can see those here. Uh, when we can't point the solar arrays at the sun, of course, we have some big batteries on board that we can draw a charge from. We're about 21 kilogram, 2100 kilograms fully loaded. And we have a number of instruments on board covering the X-ray, the visible and the infrared part of the spectrum. And then we also have a couple laser altimeters which shoot out laser beams and, and look at the return signal to figure out the topography of areas that we fly over. And I should also point out, there's this thing called the tag SAM, which I'll talk more about later as well. And this is the only part of the spacecraft that actually touches down on the asteroid. And this is how we acquire our sample right at the very end here in the tag SAM head. And then obviously very important to getting the samples back is the sample return capsule. And that you can see peeking out just towards the bottom of the spacecraft here. And I'll show you some actual pictures of what the real stuff actually looks like in a minute. Um, in terms of Bennu, Bennu is an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid. It's not that large, actually. It's only about a third of a mile in diameter, about 575 meters maximum. Um, and it's, it's, not very, uh, it, it's not very dense. It has a low density. And so there's not enough, there's not enough mass there to generate enough gra gravitational force to pull it into the shape of a sphere. And it's a microgravity environment. So it's, it's very difficult object to fly around and to orbit because there's very little gravity. In fact, if you took your bathroom scale there and tried to step on it, you would be you would have a weight of, of zero because it's so small. We're talking 10 to the negative six gravity when compared, compared to the Earth. And that's one of the challenges as we'll talk about a little bit um, in trying to explore a body like this. Now, I'll give you a little idea of what the hardware looks like. This is the only piece of hardware we actually built at NASA itself. Everything else came from our partners on the project. Um, and this is one of the spectrometers on board. It covers the visible to the infrared part of the spectrum. And it's called OVIRS. So here you can see, this was some of us in the lab after we had uh, finished it before we shipped it to Lockheed Martin for integration with the rest of the spacecraft. So you can kind of picture that in your mind. This is what it looked like kind of sitting in a normal size room, a clean room where we put it all together. Um, and this is what it looks like once it was mounted on the spacecraft. So here's Ovirs now mounted on the spacecraft. This isn't a large clean room at Lockheed Martin, uh, uh, located south of Denver, Colorado. And this was taken during a test when we were actually testing out the tag SAM, the arm that were used to touch down on the surface and acquire the sample. 
So that's what's shown right here. This is the tag SAM fully deployed. And pretty much everything you see here from kind of from this point to the right, this is all flight hardware, except for things you see colored red, which we removed before flight. But this is all flight hardware. This is the real tag SAM that we use to touch down on the surface, except for this part right here. So this is this kind of T-shaped structure is part of the ground support equipment. And we had to offload the gravity that TAGSAM was generating anytime we deployed it because we had designed it to work in a microgravity or zero G environment. And it wasn't strong enough to support itself in a one G environment. So anytime we had to move it around, take it out of its stowed position and practice uh, putting a sample into the sample return capsule, we had to offload the gravity that it was creating. So you can't see it, but outside of the frame, there's actually a large helium balloon that was always kept inflated in that clean room for any time we needed to move tag Sam around. So always kind of felt like a carnival when you're getting gowned up and going in there and this helium balloons just kind of floating around in the high bay. A few other things to point out that I'll talk about later. So here are two of the cameras on board, NavCam 1 and NavCam 2. This is one of those laser altimeters. This was actually provided by the uh, Canadian Space Agency, one of our partners on the project. Uh, two more laser altimeters, smaller ones right next to the cameras over here. And then Ovir is back up on top, like I mentioned. And then right next to Ovir is another spectrometer, a thermal infrared spectrometer that can see out to about 25 microns. Right next to it is our largest camera on board called Polycam. And that's our most sensitive camera and allowed us to pick out Bennu from the background of stars as we we're flying up to it and allowed us to navigate from a, a pretty far distance. Uh, right next to it is another camera called MapCam, which is primarily the color imaging system we had on the spacecraft. And if you see any color images of Bennu, it came from, it came from MapCam. And then there are two other cameras you can't really see very well here. There's SamCam, which is located over here. And SamCam was designed to image the tag SAM head. So this part over here, it was designed to image the tag SAM head as we're descending to the surface and watch the sample acquisition attempt. And then there's another camera called Stokecam, which we'll see some images from later, that was designed to document the uh, placement of the tag SAM head into the SRC and confirm that in fact, it was ready to fly back to earth. And then finally, the final thing to point out here is the SRC. So this is the only part of the spacecraft that flies back to earth and as you'll see later, the cover opens up and we put the sample in there, close it back up, and then this detaches from the main spacecraft and flies back to Earth. So we get asked uh, often, you know, why are we going to RQ-36 or, or Bennu? Um, and so this diagram kind of takes you through our thought process from back when the mission was first proposed. So originally the mission wanted to be an asteroid sample return mission to try to bring back an interesting sample from an asteroid. And at the time that we were proposing the mission, there were over half a million asteroids that were known, cataloged and had their orbits well quantified. Uh, of course, that's a big, that's a big list. Um, but from that, we knew we were gonna have to choose a smaller subset called uh, NEAs or near earth asteroids. And that was because those bodies spend part of their time closer to the sun than what the earth does. And from an energy management perspective and the types of spacecraft on rockets that are available today that we can launch, we knew we had to go to a body, something like that. But there's still quite a few of those. At the time, there were over 8,000 of those. Uh, so we did, we analyzed the orbits of those 8,000 bodies and found 300 candidates that looked like they would give us plenty of margin to fly to, go down, get a sample and have enough fuel to bring that sample back to Earth. So 300 is still a lot, but it's a little bit more manageable list. The next criteria was we wanted to go to an object that was bigger than 200 meters. And there were two reasons for that. One was the orbital dynamicists on their team were telling us if we go to a body that's too small, it's likely to be spinning very fast and could even have a multi-axis rotation and kind of be tumbling in space. That would make it very difficult to try to land a spacecraft and grab a sample. And in addition, the geologists on our team were saying, yeah, anything smaller than about 200 meters as well as likely not to have a lot of fine material, it's probably gonna be a very consolidated body and it'd be difficult to get a sample from that. 
So that was our next criteria that the body had to be at least 200 meters or larger. So that took the 300 list of 300 down to a list of 27. And that was something we could, you know, you can spend more time sort of studying and, and ruling out and comparing the pros and cons uh, for each of those bodies. Of those 27, five were carbonaceous. And those are the most interesting scientifically because we believe the carbonaceous bodies have a lot of organics. And one of the theories the mission was trying to check out is could bodies like these have brought organic material to the early earth from which life eventually formed? And that's the O in the uh, OSIRIS REx part of the, of, or in the, in our acronym. So that's what the O stands for is the origins. Could organic material like this have seeded life on the early earth? So there were five of those, five carbonaceous bodies. And of those five, we knew the most about RQ36 or Bennu. And so that's how we ended up selecting Bennu. Uh, we didn't know a lot about it, but of the five bodies that were carbonaceous, Bennu was the one we knew the most about. So here's a little more information on Bennu. Um, the original name actually, the designation it gets, 1999 RQ36, tells you it was discovered during the first half of September in 1999. Um, again, it's not that large. It's only about a third of a mile in diameter. And so it's not, it doesn't have enough mass to pull itself into a nice spherical shape like larger planetary bodies. And in the upper right here, you can see what our best thoughts were about what the body looked like. And this is actually based on radar Im images from uh, the Aero Cebo radio radar dish, which has recently been in the news because it's been falling apart. But thankfully for us, it was still working really well. And we got these great shape models developed from the radar data to give us an idea about what type of body we were gonna encounter once we got there. And again, it's scientifically important for two primary reasons. Um, one is it's a carbonaceous asteroid, a B-type carbonaceous asteroid. And B-type means that it's bluer than most asteroids and also quite a bit, quite, quite a bit darker than most other asteroids. It reflects only about 3% of the light that falls on it. So you can really think of it almost as being like a charcoal Cat. It's really, really dark. And all of our instruments were designed to, to image and collect data on, on a body that, that, was, that was so dark. Um, and so one of the key parts of the mission is to, is to take the sample and see if it has the material that's consistent with seeding life on the early Earth. The other scientifically interesting reason to go to this body were that it's a near-Earth asteroid, of course, and it could eventually strike us. In 2169, it has a non-zero chance of actually striking Earth. And so one of the other goals of the mission, this is part of the security part of the acronym, um, is to fly to the body, figure out, its reflect, figure out its reflectivity, its shape, and then see how well we can predict how the orbit of Bennu evolves over time. Because for small bodies like these, it's not just Newtonian physics, or gravity that governs where it's going to be in the future, because there's sunlight always hitting the body, that changes its orbit very slowly in small amounts over time. And so one of the things we're also trying to understand is how well we can predict that. So when we discover these bodies, we have a better idea of what our uncertainties are for predicting um, collisions with Earth. So to give you an idea of where Bennu lo is located in the solar system, there's this diagram in the lower left here. So Mars is the largest orbit shown here, kind of the tannish orangish color. And you can see Earth's orbit is shown as green. And then Bennu is this bluish colored orbit that's shown inclined with respect to Earth. And you can see it spends part of its time closer to the sun than what the Earth does. All right, so now I'm gonna, I kind of know the background of the mission. Now I'm gonna show you a, a short uh, video clip it kind of takes you from the point of launch up until the point where we're getting ready to go into orbit around Bennu. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft launched in 2016, and it's actually taken us two years to get to the asteroid Bennu. And in that time, we had an Earth flyby. So we used an Earth flyby in 2017 to change the plane of our orbit to match Bennu's orbit plane. And it's also provided a great opportunity from a flight dynamics perspective to really calibrate our models and learn how to fly the spacecraft which will help us in the really challenging part of the mission, which is orbiting in the low gravity environment of the asteroid. Over the past few months, the flight dynamics team has been getting images of the asteroid Bennu, and it started out as just a very small point source in the camera, and it's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the field of view. 
And that's allowed us to perform optical navigation to refine our uh, prediction of the asteroid's orbit uh, and allow us to more precisely navigate and target our approach to the asteroid. As OSIRIS-REx approaches the asteroid, we've done a series of braking maneuvers called asteroid approach maneuvers to slow down the spacecraft so that we can get into orbit around the asteroid later this year. We're also taking lots of images of Bennu to understand its rotation, look for natural satellites, and potential dust loops. This is an extremely exciting time on OSIRIS-REx as we're just poised at arrival at Bennu. And one of the most exciting things to us, and relieving too to the engineers, is how closely the asteroid has resembled what we had predicted. Early on, our science team, prior to launch, had come up with a model of what they thought the asteroid would look like based purely on ground-based radar observations from Arecibo. And from that, they created a reference asteroid that we used as the requirements to design the mission against. But no one could be sure that the asteroid would really look like the scientists had predicted. So it's been a tremendous relief to us to find that the actual Bennu is very similar to what the scientists had predicted. So the science team really nailed it. Right now as we're approaching asteroid Bennu, we're looking for debris or other objects that are orbiting the asteroid just in case we need to avoid those. And then once we arrive on December 3rd, we'll perform preliminary survey. And in preliminary survey, we fly over the North Pole, South Pole, and the middle of the asteroid. This helps us to map the gravity of the asteroid and understand how to operate near such a small body. Additionally, this will be the first time that we get close-up pictures of the surface, and we'll know how smooth or rocky the surface that we're going to study is. As we get closer to asteroid Bennu, we'll begin to map its surface in higher detail. What we'll be able to do is first identify the distribution of rocks and particles that might pose a hazard to the sampling mechanism on the spacecraft, and we'll also get a better sense of what the shape of Bennu is like at smaller scales. Looking at Bennu in more and more detail is going to help us identify all the areas that we shouldn't go to grab a sample from. Throughout 2019, we'll be doing global characterization of the asteroid, basically making maps of the entire surface. We're interested in its topography. Are there craters? Where are the boulders, the valleys, the mountains of the asteroid? And then we want to understand the distribution of geologic materials. Are we finding different patches of minerals in one location versus another? And why are certain areas of habit composition and others maybe different? We're going to be looking, most importantly, for areas where we can collect a sample. OSIRIS-REx will collect a sample from Bennu using our TAGSAM, which is the Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism. What that is, is an arm connected to this sampler head that you see here. This is similar in size to an air filter from a car. How this mechanism works is there's compressed gas that is released that will stir up the regolith from Bennu, store it into this canister, which we will then put inside of our sample release capsule and bring back to Earth. We will collect the sample of Bennu in 2020 and return it to Earth in 2023. Once we're in the vicinity of our home world, about four and a half hours before impacting the top of the atmosphere, the spacecraft spins up and releases that sample return capsule. The spacecraft fires its engines to perform a deflection burn, going off into orbit around the sun, and then the return capsule enters the Earth's atmosphere, targeting a landing in the Utah desert. I'll be there on site when we open that capsule up and see those samples for the first time. And science begins at that point on the next phase of the mission, the sample analysis period. All right, so that gives you an idea of where things were um, back in late 2018, just as we were getting ready to go into orbit around Bennu. Um, unfortunately, our first surprise was that the government shut itself down on December 22nd, right as we were getting to go, ready to go into orbit. And that was due to the president and the Congress at the time not being able to reach an agreement on a budget. So all the NASA folks that were working the mission, a lot of us got furloughed, some of us didn't. Um, so we kind of had a skeleton crew. Fortunately, our partners on the project had already been paid for at least a month's worth of work. So they, didn't, they weren't affected immediately. Uh, by the shutdown, which was a good thing, because we were able to successfully enter orbit, even though it was a little bit harder than we thought, um, on December 31 of 2018. And one of the things we were doing as we were getting ready to go into orbit, and then as we were in orbit around Bennu, uh, as it was talked about in the video, we have to take optical navigation images to figure out where we are with respect to Bennu, and where Bennu is with respect to the rest of the solar system. 
And so we we're taking a series of images every day, every couple of hours or so along exposure so that we could see stars around Bennu. And that's what these images show right here, these two at the top. And then also short exposure so we could see landmarks on the surface of Bennu. Um, and then, so we're taking these images every day and on January 7th, we were looking at the images that we had taken on January 6th to make sure we were in the place we were supposed to be. And we noticed something strange. It looked like Bennu was actually, actually ejecting material. And that's what's shown in um, these little insets here uh, in these images. And this was potentially very exciting to us because asteroids aren't generally believed to be active. They're kind of the dead parts of the solar system. It's comets when they get close to the sun that become active and start to throw off material. But there are very few asteroids that are known to do this, like just half a dozen or so at the time when uh, we saw this. So potentially it was very exciting, very important from a scientific standpoint, but we couldn't be 100% sure because we had seen features like this in our camera images even before we had gotten to Bennu. And these were caused by radiation events due to cosmic ray hits hitting the spacecraft or electronics or the, the, or the cameras themselves. And so at the time we kicked off this big investigation to figure out, is this real? Because it was potentially very exciting, but we had to have uh, very firm proof that in fact this was happening at Bennu. So we created a whole fishbone diagram and had to lay out all potential uh, causations of this activity. Um, of course, you know, for this to be a radiation event, it would have had to happen twice in close in, in a close period in a short period of time, which usually doesn't happen. Usually it happens once a day and you don't see it again for several several days. So that really lent itself to this being real. But we were worried that maybe our spacecraft was ejecting particles or there was some kind of electronic issue inside the spacecraft. So we went off on this big study with this small crew of people that were still able to work to try to figure out what was going on. Um, at the same time, we decided, well, if this is real, we should try to observe it with a lot higher, um, a lot higher rate of imaging. Because again, we're only taking images for optical navigation every few hours. And if there's this kind of dynamic activity going around, around the body, we should probably try to document it on a more regular basis. So we are able to put some plans in and, and prepare some commands for the spacecraft and got that loaded up to, uh, to OSIRIS-REx. And we started imaging with a higher cadence in on January 11th. And at the same time, as we're trying to figure out, is this real or not, we decided, boy, the tools we kind of had to do this kind of thing, to analyze this type of data, we really weren't up to snuff at the time. We were doing, from these two images, all the work initially done on it was all being done manually, basically zooming in, counting by hand how many particles, how big they were, what their intensity was, and that kind of thing. So while all this investigation is going on, we're trying to develop better tools to help our situational awareness of what's happening at Bennu while we're there. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait too long and Bennu cooperated with us and that high rate imaging ended up paying off on January 19. And so we were able to actually catch some more particles being ejected off of the surface. And this time it was in four images, which the four successive images, in fact, and you could track from frame to frame. So these are the four frames processed a little bit differently to kind of bring out the streaks and the little points of light. And again, these aren't, this isn't anything you can resolve. These are just little, a few pixels in size, um, unresolved particles, unresolved points of light that appear to be moving around at different velocities. And now with four images, it was easier to track frame to frame. So at this point, we were able to get rid of all those other hypotheses about what could be causing this. And we knew in fact that Bennu was active and it was ejecting material uh, into space. At this, about the same time then, we had these tools kind of ready to go and do a, a better job and help us understand what was happening. So I'm going to show you the first tool that we, that we developed in its kind of early stages. In fact, this is one of the first animations we developed from it. And what this tool does is it takes these images in and it blocks out the part that we know is, is all Bennu. And then it removes things in the images that are known objects like catalog stars or other solar system objects that are in the background. And so all what you're left with are potential particles from Bennu or noise caused by detector um, fluctuations. So I'll show you a little animation. Now, some of this you'll see, you know, it just looks like dots. Those are probably noise. But if you look carefully, you'll start to be able to see little streaks. And those are the bodies that are in fact coming off of Bennu. And you'll see the January 19 event 
um, that is shown in these four images here as well. And that comes out pretty clearly. So again, all these little points are things that are things we don't know what they are. They're not stars, they're not solar system objects. And if you look carefully, you can see, sometimes you can track them frame to frame. And those are the ones we know are definite particles. There was a pretty good trail right there. Now the 19th is coming up, you'll see a little explosion, a bunch of particles get ejected. And then there's, a, I think there's another one coming up. You'll see a nice trail that comes up kind of on the left-hand side. You can track it for a little, uh, that one, there's, there it is. So these are the kind of tools, and this actually was a, probably one of the more important ones because it allowed you to take all these images now. We were taking over 200 images a day, and we had this tool now that could analyze those more autonomously. You only had to kind of set thresholds and things like that. It would pick out these particles and give you a whole list. Okay, where are they in space? And you know, how, in, how big are they? That type of thing, very useful tool. And we, we kind of built it on the fly within that you know, kind of week time period when all this activity was going on. We also did a better job of being able to process the single frame. So I'll show you one of the, this is a highly processed image from the very first event on January 6th. So you can see you know, a nice properly exposed image of Bennu and then you can see a bunch of particles moving away from it. Some of them are just, again, just little point sources of light because they're moving kind of slowly, but then you can also see these streaks. And these are objects that are moving a lot faster compared to the exposure time of the image. So that's from January 6th. There's another nice one from January 19. So not quite as big, obviously, as what we saw on January 6th, but still an event nonetheless. And you can see little point sources of light again, and you look further out and you can see streaks in the images as well. So another important tool that was sort of the final part of the processing and trying to develop our situational awareness of what going on was a tool that could take all of the objects that we didn't know what they were and try and fit orbits to them. And that was really the final confirmation that you know you have a body that's real because you can prove to yourself that it's reacting to the gravity environment of Bennu as well as the solar pressure from the sunlight that's constantly falling on it. So what I'm gonna show you next is kind of that final tool and we'll show you animations of uh, a few particle ejection events that we observed and were able to fit orbits to some of the bodies that were ejected off. So the first one will be the January 19 event. So in blue, you can see OSIRIS-REx orbit and all the yellow trails are objects from Bennu. And if you watch, you can see there's kind of three types of activity. Some Particles go up and they just come right back down. Others leave the surface and go on a hyperbolic trajectory, never to return. And then you know, there's another fraction that actually go into a semi-stable orbit. So all these tools were very useful and allowed us to consume and analyze a lot of data in a fairly quick amount of time to really understand what was going on. And finally, a little over a year ago now, we published our results in uh, the journal Science. And these are some of what I think are the most interesting figures from that paper. And in the upper left here, this is an image, or this shows you the number of pl particles plotted versus day of, the, uh, day of the year. And the color coding, corresponds to major events and minor events, and then just observations. So the purple shows you the, the major particle ejection events that we reported on in the paper. The orange shows you what we considered minor ejection events. And then kind of the aqua color show you when we just observed particles. It wasn't necessarily tied to a particular ejection event, but if you looked, you could see that there were particles in orbit around Bennu. In the upper right here, you see images of the surface where we believe the ejection events originated from. Um, the first one on the left here is from the January 6 event, the middle one's from January 19, and then on the right it's from February 11. Unfortunately, we don't have pre and post images of these areas on the surface. So there's a lot of speculation at the time and still kind of is as to, okay, what is causing this activity? So in this paper, we outlined about eight or nine different possible mechanisms for what might be causing the ejection behavior. At the time, we thought the leading cause might be due to thermal fracturing because these, particularly the large events seem to be correlated with local afternoon, roughly about three o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon on the body is when 
these particles tended to be ejected. And the idea there is that you have the surface for part of its, uh, of course at night, it's pointed towards the, uh, the coldest space. So it gets really cold. It rotates into the sunlight and by mid afternoon, it's at its highest um, temperature point. And then you have um, uh, thermal stresses in the surface material and the material starts to crack and you don't need a lot of energy in this microgravity environment to send particles into space. So at the time, that was kind of our favorite theory. Um, the other one that was sort of competing at the time was, look, this, this body is living in the same part of space as what Earth does. And of course, we all know Earth is always getting struck by little micrometeoroids. Anytime you see a shooting star, that's something coming from, from the solar system into our uh, atmosphere. And Bennu occupies about the same uh, area of space. And so the idea is, is that these events are just being caused by, by Bennu getting struck by little particles, and then you get a cascade of particles from that. Um, the other big theory or leading theory at the time was that this could be caused by volatile release from thiosilicates in the surface. And again, there it's tied to kind of the local afternoon, mid-afternoon type um, of time frame of being released because it's a thermal thing. It gets heated up, um, the vapor generates enough pressure and you spew some particles out into space. Um, and of course it could be any, it could be any combination of these. Right now we think as we've seen more of this activity, it doesn't seem to be as strongly correlated with late afternoon or mid afternoon um, conditions on the surface. And so now I think our, our leading theory is, is probably the micrometeoroid um, that we're getting micrometeoroid hits. But again, it could be any combination of things. So it's something that we're still trying to understand and, and will be a, a thing to study for, for quite a while. Um, the other thing you'll, we noticed is that these have, um, like I mentioned earlier, when we're looking at the animation, um, if they go into orbit, the orbits are only stable for roughly about a week, maybe two weeks. Otherwise they, eventually they tend to fall back down on the surface. But the fact that like this plot shows you that we're always observing particles in orbit, it tells you that even though we're not seeing the ejection events, there must be events that are happening, happening to replace that population. Because otherwise you wouldn't see just a constant population of material about the body. And so we know that there are ejection events that, were, that we didn't catalog and that we didn't see just because we're always seeing a consistent population of material um, around Bennu. And fortunately, the spacecraft guys were really happy with the information we were able to generate because they were very concerned when we first got into orbit and we noticed this, the question came up as to, is it safe to even stay in orbit? Are we gonna get hit by one of these things and damage one of our instruments or even you know, do something critical to the spacecraft that doesn't allow us to take a sample? Um, so we had a big discussion at that time. We decided to stay in orbit so we could study this more and Fortunately, based on the statistics and all the observations, um, the spacecraft folks went off and they did the same type of analysis that they do when they're trying to understand what the risk is to launch from Kennedy Space Center through all the crud that's currently surrounding Earth. And they used the same type of risk analysis and statistics and decided that it was actually safer for us to stay in orbit about Bennu for an extended period of time and that it was actually safer than what it had been to launch even initially. Um, through all the material that's that's surrounding Earth. And these bodies, they're not all that large. You know, they're small little pebbles up to the size of about a softball. And they're not moving all that quickly with respect to the spacecraft, about seven miles per hour. So they probably, even if you would happen to make contact with one, you're probably not likely to damage something unless it hit you in a very sensitive spot. But we felt that it was safe to continue. So this is this was probably the most exciting thing from a, from a pure exploration standpoint. It was really unexpected that we would see this type of behavior on Bennu. So we're, we were really happy we were able to observe something like this and ended up you know, sharing it with the rest of the community about a year ago. All right, so now I wanna show you uh, another quick video. And this kind of takes you from the point of, okay, we've done our science operations up until the point we were, where we were getting ready to go and acquire our asteroid sample. As we started to approach Bennu from a distance and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. 
exactly what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting and what we had designed. We have never done this before. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close paths to the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. After the additional observations of Bennu, we had to down select to four sites and then go back and survey those sites even further to select the final primary sample site. My first impression of Nightingale is that's the last place I wanted to go. But as we started looking at other sites, we saw that one, this is probably one of the most sampleable sites. And two, we were overperforming in our navigation capability and our ability to contact. Natural feature tracking works a lot like the human mind in that we pick up landmarks along the way. As we descend, we look at features on the ground. We program the computer to recognize certain features. It takes a picture, says this feature is not where I expected it to be. It's a little bit off to the side, updates its position based on where it's pointed and where that feature shows up in the camera position. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position and velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag sand, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample, and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. But there are several things that could go wrong. We also have to be prepared that we won't be successful on our first try at Nightingale. We don't only get one shot at TAG. We actually have three nitrogen bottles on board the spacecraft, so we can potentially do three TAG attempts if needed. We go through several what-if scenarios, and this is how we actually prepare for a lot of our contingencies. So we've had to look all around the surface and identify the rocks and boulders that if the space truck were to tip over up to 25 degrees, it could come into contact and be damaged. We had to develop a hazard map, which we programmed into the computer and says, if you're getting too close to those hazards, we'll do a wave off, we'll back away from the asteroid, and we'll come back and do this another day. Everything might work perfectly. We come down, we touch the surface just where we want to, we fire the gas bottle, but the area we contact is covered in large rocks. Those rocks would prevent any fine grain material from being stirred up and captured in the tag sand pit. Another similar scenario is if the tag sand were to touch on the edge of a boulder and become tipped up. In that case, when the gas bottle fires, much of that gas escapes out the side, not churning up the material that we want to capture. The day of TAG is going to be really exciting, but the excitement for our team doesn't end there. We have to verify that we have a proper signal. First, we're going to image the tag sand head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're going to do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement, in which we stick out the arm and spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home, or if we have to try again. This is the culmination of, of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. And it is really exciting to know that we're finally going to be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth. All right, so that gives you an idea of kind of where our heads were at, what we were thinking back when we attempted the first acquisition. And this was all this is all recent news, right? This just happened last October. So our first attempt was on October 20, just last fall. And when we when we did it, so here's a orbital diagram. When we did this, Bennu was pretty much the furthest thing from us from Earth in the inner solar system at the time. You can see everything else was kind of on our side of the sun, but Bennu was way over here, and 
Of course, all this had to be done automatically because the time of flight for communications was a little over 18 minutes at that point. So this was the attempt all had to be done automatically using the spacecraft computer. And so we were headed to the Nightingale site shown right here, as you saw in the video. So what I'm gonna show you next is a series of images, kind of a, a, a quick little video clip that shows the perspective from the spacecraft, from the SAMCAM camera, looking at the tag SAM head as we were coming down to the surface. So here we're flying down. We're gonna straighten up the head with respect to the surface. And then we punched through. I mean, it was just, when we first saw these images, it was really quite a surprise how the surface reacted to the sampling acquisition attempt. So next I'm gonna show you another set of images. These are the actual images taken by NavCam2. And these are the images that the spacecraft was using to automatically determine whether or not it was on the right trajectory to go to the right location to acquire the sample. So you'll see us leaving orbit and then you can kind of tell the spacecraft finding its way until we make touchdown. And then the video lasts for about a minute and a half to two minutes after we actually make contact with the surface. So here we are before leaving orbit. And then you can see we make a burn and we adjust our trajectory. And now you can see the Nightingale sample site up at the top here starting to come into view. And now it's outside the field of view, but you can get an idea of where it is if you look at the tag SAM shadow will be coming into the field here in a minute. And so the touchdown point is just to the upper right there. So there's contact and then we start to back away. And you can see just how chaotic and hard to decipher this whole set of images are. It was really surprising when we first, we first saw these images come down. But of course, we didn't get these images right away. It took quite a bit of time, but we did have some telemetry um, almost right after the event happened. So those were from sensors that were on the spacecraft. And what we first learned was that the surface offered almost no resistance to us as we went to touch down on it. So on the left-hand side here, you see a, a picture of, of TAGSAM, an artist's rendition of it. And the TAGSAM forearm was built kind of like a pogo stick. It was spring-loaded. And so, and there was a sensor attached to it. And when that spring was depressed to a certain level, that would trigger the sensor to uh, fire the, it, it would trigger the sensor and the sensor would tell the spacecraft computer to go ahead and release the nitrogen gas or try and collect a sample. And then a few seconds later, initiate the back and we burn to safely move the spacecraft away from, from Bennu. But what we found out when we saw the telemetry stream was that that sensor in fact never tripped. And so the, that tells us that the, the surface of Bennu was extremely weak. And in fact, if you compare that force required to trip that sensor to what it would be on earth, that'd be equivalent to about 15 pounds of force, uh, which is like a, a adult sized bowling ball. So imagine an adult sized bowling ball and what kind of surfaces that would be able to fall through. So our analogy at the time was that the surface strength was similar to freshly fallen snow here on earth. And in fact, the analogy would almost be perfect if you took that bowling ball and put it like on a 12 inch pizza pan and let that touch the surface because the size of the tag sand head is 12 inches in diameter. So very weak surface, um, not totally unexpected fortunately because part of the backup logic we had on the spacecraft was okay, if the spacecraft never senses contact with the surface, we don't wanna bury the arm into the surface and we certainly don't wanna bury the spacecraft into the surface. So what ended up happening was the spacecraft took its last set of images before making contact and made a calculation and said, okay, I'm this far away from the surface based on the best information I have. And it set a timer for how long it should take based on the rate of descent and how far away it was. And so it was looking for that sensor contact. When it didn't sense that, it went to this fallback position and said, okay, I should have made contact quite a few seconds ago already. Um, let's blow the nitrogen gas, collect the sample, and then execute the back wave burn a few seconds later. And that's what ended up happening. And that's how we collected the sample. 
of course, once we got these images back, we started to really see just how strange and uh, unexpected the response of the surface was. So I'm gonna show you a few more images from that Descent movie. This is kind of an overview image that shows you the outline of the last frame we took before we make contact with the surface. And this is the contact point right up here. So this is where Tag Sam touched the surface. And you can see just as we were starting to touch down that we were starting to generate some material as we were making contact with the surface. And of course, initially the images were very difficult to understand. It was so chaotic. But if you played the animation and you look at the images um, and you study them enough, you start to be able to orientate yourself. So I'm gonna kind of help you do that so you can just get a feel for the type of thing we were doing right after we touched down. So this is another still frame from that animation or from that set of, of images. And it shows you a combination of things. It shows you a lot of material that's been lofted that we've liberated from the surface, particularly this bright plume here. This is all lofted material. But if you look to the right, kind of the lower right corner and even up on the side and to the lower left, you can still make out landmarks on the surface that were completely undisturbed. And so that helped us understand what was happening, giving us an idea of surface strength and also the interesting microgra microgravity dy dynamics that were going on. Um, and in particular, we could also determine scale once we kind of had these landmarks. So everything you kind of see in the images are things you could kind of hold in your hand. So this bright rock, which was something that we see in a lot of the images, particularly during the back away, it's about five inches in diameter. So about the size of a men's shot put. And so a lot of these things are about that size or smaller, except for these things that are more like boulder size that are actually sitting on the surface. So I'm gonna show you two other little videos now where we zoom in onto the interesting things that are happening. The first one will be on this area right here. You'll see this rock tumbling around. You'll see this other rock that's kind of moving around and it's been lofted, but it hasn't reached the high enough altitude for it to move past all the material that's still on the ground. And you'll see it hit this boulder that's still entrained on the surface and kind of break apart and fall down. So to the left here, you see that bright rock that's spinning. If you look over here to the right, here's this rock that's coming in. Doesn't quite have enough height to get above that boulder that's still on the ground. And so it hits it and sort of breaks apart. You can see how weak some of the material is. It just doesn't take a lot for it to, to break apart and to generate these smaller materials. Like we think that plume that was lofted is mostly made up of stuff that was created after we actually touch down and things start to collide with each other. So now the video is just playing in reverse to kind of help your eye follow it. All right, I'm gonna show you another video. This is a zoom in on that bright rock that's about five inches in diameter, the size of the men's shot put. And you'll see it kind of come up from the bottom of the plume and then two other rocks will, will kind of bang up against it and one of the rocks gets destroyed from that interaction. So here's the bright rock there. You can see the two rocks. And then that one sort of gets cleaved by the other one. So for the first few days after the sample acquisition attempt, we were really digging into this, trying to figure out what was happening because it was all so interesting and unexpected and tells us a lot about the surface and about the how uh, different, different rock types are. Some appear to be quite a bit stronger uh, the other one. So now it's just playing in reverse again. You can see the, the rock coming back together. So this kept us very busy and, and everybody was very excited to go off and look at this data. But then we had to get to the next part of the mission plan. And that was to take images of the tag SAM head with the SAM cam camera. And that's what this shows you right here. So this was taken just two days after the sample acquisition attempt. So this is on October 22. Um, and it was sort of a good news, bad news thing. The good news was it looked like we had a lot of material inside the sample head. Um, doing an analysis of how much light was getting through this mesh and doing a visual, visible inspection of what was inside there. It looked like we had several hundred grams of material when the minimum requirement was 60. So that was the good news. The bad news I think you can see for yourselves here is that we were also losing material. We had gathered up so much material that these flaps that were supposed to close, some of them couldn't close because they were stuck, they were stuck full of rocks. And so we were losing material anytime we moved the arm 
or the spacecraft around. So obviously this was a big concern because we didn't want to lose everything that we had just acquired. So we took about a day and we went off and we analyzed the data. Um, and, and again, we had to do this manually because we didn't really have the best tools to allow us to do, do it any other way. So there are a couple different teams that independently came up with their own estimates for how much material we thought was in the head. And then almost as importantly, how much material were we losing every time we moved the spacecraft or the arm around? And again, it looked like we had several hundred grams of material, but we were losing about 10 grams anytime we moved anything around. So we made a special presentation to headquarters, NASA headquarters on September, October 24, and, and laid out what, was, what we thought was happening and what we wanted to do, which was basically to rip out all the parts of the playbook that didn't involve getting the sample safely into the sample return capsule and then closing that up and making sure we had enough material to bring back to Earth. Fortunately, headquarters listened uh, to us carefully and con concurred with our plan. And so on that Saturday afternoon, the team began almost around the clock operation, not, not continuous, but it was very long days and very long hours to try to safely get as much sample into the sample return capsule as we could. So by Tuesday, then of the following week, we were ready to open the sample return capsule. So that was early on Tuesday, October 27. And then later in the day on Tuesday, early morning, Wednesday, we actually had the tag SAM sample head stowed into the SRC. And then later that same day on Wednesday, we pulled back on the head to confirm that it was securely inside the sample return capsule. And then same thing on Wednesday, once we knew that it was safely stowed, we fired a command that cut the nitrogen uh, tube and blew a bolt at the end of the uh, forearm that connected the head to the tag sam forearm and then moved the arm out of the way. And then late on Wednesday, we closed the SRC and the operation was complete. And that whole process took about 28 hours. So quite a bit, we, sp we sped things up quite a bit. Normally we had expected to do, to do it over about five days and we did it just over basically two days worth of work. So now I'll show you the video that shows all those steps. Of course, this couldn't be done automatically. We didn't have any, any kind of logic on board that allowed us to do this automatically. So each key step, we had to look at the images and verify that, yeah, that went properly. We can proceed to the next, the next part of the process. So that's why it took so long and you couldn't do it in the, you know, about 46 seconds or so that this, these images actually take to play. So there you can see us opening up the SRC. You can see some material even floating around as we do that. You'll see the head appear. There's another big chunk of something flying. And then here's us putting the tag SAM head into the sample return capsule. Some more material flying around. So here's us trying to pull it back out, proving to ourselves that it's securely locked in place with the latches. And then we cut the tube and we blew the frange a bolt, moved the arm out of the way. And then we knew it was safe to close up the cover. And there you can still see some material still floating around. So that was a big day. That was almost as exciting as, uh, as tag day. So we believe that we actually have achieved mission success with our sample acquisition. We believe there's a lot more than 60 grams in the, in the SRC. We think we still have probably two to three, maybe even 400 grams of material that we're bringing back to earth. So to help you orientate yourself to that, I, I pulled this out of my kitchen this morning. So this is a box of baking soda and this is about 450 grams. So we're talking about this, this amount of material we're bringing back of Bennu to earth for further analysis. Um, the the post uh, stow checkouts of the spacecraft all prove that everything's working well, it survived tag, we should be able to safely fly back to earth. Of course, now our attention has focused again to analyzing all the interesting things that happened during the tag event. And there's some papers that are being written right now for a conference that's coming up. Um, right now, our departure burn is planned for May 10. So later this spring, we'll be leaving Bennu. And recently, this is kind of late breaking news, uh, we're breaking uh, a mission rule we had in place for the whole mission, which was once we get a sample in the SRC, 
we're not going to do anything that would jeopardize um, getting that sample back to Earth, including flying back to Bennu. But because the surface interactions, the microgravity environment, and the surface strength questions raised by our interaction with the asteroid surface, we've decided to, to break that rule with concurrence from headquarters, and we're going to fly back to Bennu and do a pass over the sampling site on April 6 to get a, a, a final idea as to exactly what we did to the surface and how much material we excavated and where it landed back on the, the rest of the surface. So that'll be exciting and there'll be some press releases um, that day or, the, or shortly thereafter once we do that. Um, if, May, if something happens and we can't do the burn on May 10, we have a backup opportunity on May 24. But no matter when we end up leaving, we will land in the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah on September 24 in 2023. And once the sample return makes it back, the sample return capsule makes it back on the ground, it'll be recovered, we'll open it up, and then all that material that's inside there will go to Johnson Space Center. And the folks on the project that are uh, laboratory scientists, geochemists and such, they'll actually get small amounts of, of Bennu in their laboratory and they'll do further analyses. And they like to say that's where the most exciting science will happen. Once they can bring the full range of modern day laboratory experimentation to the sample, that's where we'll learn the most. Um, so that should be exciting. So that's what's gonna to happen to the sample. The spacecraft, and this is also kind of late breaking news, the spacecraft, because it's in such good shape and we have plenty of fuel left, we're currently in the process of planning a potential follow-on mission. This would be to another near earth asteroid called Apophis. And these are some recent infrared images of Apophis taken by the Herschel spacecraft operated by the European Space Agency. And they've developed a, a crude shape model for it. Apophis is kind of a famous asteroid. Um, it's gonna do a very close flyby to Earth in April of 2029. And in fact, it's gonna be only about 19,000 miles away from the surface. So it'll be much closer than even most of our navigation satellites that are currently orbiting Earth. So in 2029, there'll be a lot of interest around Apophis. And right now we're thinking of flying what's left of the OSIRIS spacecraft when we deliver to the sample, the rest of it will fly to Apophis and do similar studies to what we did with Bennu with Apophis. So hopefully headquarters will fund that and we'll have some more exciting things to share in, in a few more years. That's all I have. Happy to answer questions if you guys wanna hang around for a little bit. Yeah, I think we did get uh, a few questions. Um, so there's a couple in the, uh, chat and here's one in the question and answer. So I don't know if you saw that one. Uh, uh, but, uh, Israel asked, uh, does earth lose particles as well? So I think that was, uh, a little bit earlier when you were mentioning that, um, how it was dangerous when you launched Bennu. Uh, because there's particles in the area of space where the Earth is. So, no, the, what I was talking about, the things that are sort of surrounding Earth, those are all things we've launched. Those are, those are things we've put there. Of course, when we have large impacts, there's enough energy that can be imparted to particles that they will leave Earth. But, they'll, you know, those are like extinction type events, the, the types of things that, you know, strike us that are large objects. But no, all the things we got to fly through um, when we launch things now are all things we've put there ourselves, you know. United States, Soviet Union, European Space Agency, anybody who's launching material into space, uh, China now is doing that. So um, it's, a, it's, it's becoming a bigger problem, you know, each and every year because more and more stuff is getting launched and, you know, it stays up there. So a lot of, a lot of projects now, part of their planning has to be, okay, what are you going to do with this spacecraft, anything that stays in Earth orbit? The part of the, the mission plan is, okay, what are you going to do when you're done with the mission? Because usually you want to try to fly it back into the atmosphere and have it break up um, and fall back to Earth somewhere in the Pacific Ocean instead of continuing to populate this already very crowded, um, you know, mass of material that's currently surrounding Earth. Cool. Uh, can you see the question and answer page, by the way? Uh, what do I, no, I don't see anything. What do uh, I, do maybe. I click on more maybe? Uh, maybe. Yeah. I'm gonna. Hold on. I see a chat, and then uh, you can stop sharing. Okay, maybe it's just me then, because uh, uh, you got a, a message from uh, Ted Hahn, who worked with you at Donnelly Automotive. Uh, <laughs> so good to hear from you. What does Ted have a question? 
Yeah, yeah. So he says hi, and then uh, sorry, sorry, you can't see that. Um, and then he said, "Well, while you guys work together on lighting optics, you guys had discussions about the merits of human versus machine exploration. Uh -huh. So, what are your current views on the values of human exploration versus machine probe exploration?" Well, I think from a purely scientific perspective, I think you can do probably a better job cheaper with robotic missions. Um, but I still think you can do, in terms of inspiring people and in terms of making us a multi-planet species, human exploration is, is as important. Um, so I think if you line up science, you know, science to science, particularly from a cost standpoint, you can do a lot more with robotic missions. But in terms of making us a multi-planet species, that only comes from having experience flying humans into space, you know, practicing how to keep keep them alive in these harsh environments and figuring out what kind of resources, how to utilize those resources that you find out in space. So I think it's a balance of both. Again, pure science probably do it better with a robotic mission. I mean, so I think it, it, it comes down to cost. If you think about um, like what our, our mission, so the Osiris Trucks mission is about a billion dollars when you include the launch vehicle costs and all of that. Um, Mars Perseverance, which just landed this week on Thursday, um, in Jezero Crater, I think that's a few billion dollar mission as well. And then you look back on the space shuttle, which was supposed to be pretty economical, ended up not being, but a single over the lifetime of the shuttle program, and you look at all the launches, each shuttle launch was a billillion dollars. So, you know, you kind of, you, 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 know, you look at the science return per, per cost, I think, you know, that argues for the robotic missions and you can certainly go to more dangerous places than what you can currently currently go to with a, with a human crew, but being able to, but it's also, I think, important to our society and the nation mm -hmm. to be able to put people into space and also eventually be able to colonize areas where there are actual resources and things that can benefit all of society. In particular, if you do have one of these cataclysmic type collisions with, with an asteroid. Um, if you're just living on earth, that's probably the end of the species. But if you're somewhere else, then, you know, we survive and we go on. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a great response. You know, we, we, we've been talking about stuff like that around the planetarium a lot too. And uh, one of the things that we were thinking is that it isn't necessarily an either or um, because if we do have these advanced robotic spacecraft that can do things that robots you know 20 years ago can't do we can do stuff like uh build uh habitats for people or you know build infrastructure for human exploration so you know we'll get better at both and we'll be able to do more of both so i'm pretty excited about that oh, Ooh, okay here's a question with uh apophis coming as close as nineteen thousand miles what is the orbit trajectory? Is there any concern uh, about a collision with Earth? Yeah, so when Apophis was originally discovered in the, I think 2007 maybe, um, it was one of those ones that made the news that this thing's gonna hit us in 2029. And then as you as you get more measurements and you figure out what the orbit was, um, you know, that sort of concern went away. But that is the issue with near Earth asteroids that you know, they cross our, our orbit at some point or come close to us. And if we're in the same point in space as the body is, they're going to strike us. And, you know, just a few years ago, we had that the uh, uh, in Chelyabinsk, Russia, there was a there was a large explosion there that, you know, I think it, it harmed like a thousand people. And that was just a small body and that was an airburst. So, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons Apophis is getting a lot of attention right now, because if you're going to go to it and study it, you sort of have to get the mission plans going right now. So I'm not just Osiris Rex is another mission proposal. I'm, I'm a part of that is looking at launching a, a spacecraft to go and, and follow it. Um, you know, it's not going to hit us in 2029. We think we understand the orbit well enough now. That that's not going to happen. But, you know, these things are cyclical and they get these orbits change a little bit over time because of that solar pressure. This is another small body. Apophis is actually smaller than Bennu. I think it's about 300 meters in diameter. So this is another body that can easily get perturbed. You think about, you know, photon pressure as almost being nothing, but that pressure is constantly uh, on the body. So it does change the body's orbit over time, especially over these long periods of time, you know, mm -hmm. tens of years, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Cool. All 
All right. So we, we had some questions about, um, you know, the structure of Bennu. So because Bennu is so much, you know, softer than, than expected, uh, John was asking, uh, what about firing shots or some kind of projectile into the asteroid before attempting the landing to figure out the characteristics before before you endanger the spacecraft. Yeah, well, that's that's a good thought. There's actually another team a lot like ours, part of the jet. There's a Japanese mission called Hayabusa 2, um, which went to asteroid Ryagu and recently arrived back on Earth. And actually, we're going to house some of the Ryagu samples in the same location that the the Johnson Space Center. And they, in fact, did that. They used an impactor, and that's how they collected some of their material. They didn't even bother. They didn't even have to fly down to go get it. So there are a lot of ideas there. The Japan, it's, it's interesting. So we kind of teamed up with the, the Japanese group doing that because we thought there were a lot of lessons learned we could share between ourselves. So we actually, one of the reasons we're getting some of their material and some of our material is going to go to them is because we teamed up. Um, but if you look at JAXA, that's the Japanese Space Agency, they're much more, I think like NASA was probably like in the 60s or early 70s, a lot more uh, willing to take risks and do sort of crazy things. So when, yeah, when we got to know these guys and they told us some of the work they were doing and some of the last minute changes they even made to their spacecraft before they launched were just stuff you would never dare do with NASA anymore. NASA has become very risk averse. So everything has to be very, you know, proven out, very safe. Um, Whereas the Japanese probe, I think they're, they're willing to do a, a, a few crazier things, some more exciting things in, in some ways. Um, but uh, of course, our you know our approach was able to collect a lot more sample than what than what the approaches they they chose, and so we're you know bringing back the biggest the biggest trove of extraterrestrial material since the Apollo days, um, at least from a NASA perspective. So, but yeah, they um, they they in fact did that. They had a projectile. Watching those movies is really fun. It's really and they. You know that surface interacted in, in a kind of similar way, um, so we should have, you know, should have realized that maybe the, maybe all these small bodies. Ryagu is another um, body that's that's pretty small. Maybe they all have that sort of characteristic in common that they're that they're loosely consolidated, kind of a rubble pile, loosely held together based on the the density information we had. I mean, that is one thing you could conjecture is that um that's kind of weakly held together in fact we think Bennu actually came from a larger body some point in time and that it's a it's remnants of a, a a collision from millions of years ago so and one of, and one of the reasons to fly to Apophis is to see okay using exactly the same instrumentation how similar is Apophis to Bennu are you know are these bodies a lot like each other or is there a big you know diversity in in how they behave and, and how they've these small bodies have ended up you know, that's funny. You know, it, it's so logical that you think, okay, well, it's so small, it'll probably be a very loosely bound body, loosely aggregated body, but it's just so alien to what we humans think about. You're, it's it's very strange to think about, well, you know, you might land on it, you might just go right through it, you know. Um, yeah, we, you know, you can see in the animations, our prejudices, you know, built into that. We sort of, you know, tell them, well, you know, kind of a loose sandy rocky thing and then you hit something hard well we hit all that loose you know kind of uh, pebbly stuff but we never had anything hard so yeah. Um, yeah it's been it's a good learning experience again pure exploration always surprises you so that's what makes these missions fun to work on yeah absolutely um we have a few more questions i don't want to keep you all day all day but uh if you don't mind we got oh, good. five questions yeah uh, so how can this mission uh, potentially help the future of asteroid mining? So that's a really good uh, question. In fact, um, one of like the lead scientists now from Arizona, um, uh, Dante Loretta, I think, is actually on some boards of some startups that are looking at doing that, doing, um, you know, bringing in resources from asteroids. And one of the big things is really um, how to navigate and fly and even touch down on these on these small bodies that have almost no gravity. It's a lot more, you know, it's a lot more like rendezvousing with a spacecraft, but unfortunately there's enough force that if you ignore it, you're going to run into problems. And so that was one of the big challenges in the mission and why we had so many cameras as part of the mission was we knew we were going to have to take a lot of pictures just to make sure that we knew where we were, you know, every couple of hours, because it was easy to, it would be easy to get pushed out of orbit it, because 
the other thing is the you know the the bodies aren't uniform in their in their mass distribution so you have um little little areas where the gravity is different depending on what you're flying over so your acceleration is changing constantly as you're flying over these bodies and of course you have the solar pressure acting on the spacecraft just like it does on the asteroid and so we had to take try to take all of that into account when we were planning the insertion burns to put the spacecraft into orbit and so one of the big lessons learned is that okay we understand it enough and we can fly around these bodies without damaging ourselves or flying into it so that's probably the biggest lesson learned um, from the mission and you know, I don't know if NASA will use it, but certainly these companies now that are starting up that want to go and, and try to do in situ research utilization, you know, creating rocket fuel in space or heavy metals or things like that. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to benefit from that. And then of course, you know, it's more of a buyer beware or, or you know, just lessons learned is don't expect the surface to behave like things you're used to on earth. You know, think about all the different scenarios, what can make a body look that way, and try to have a range of, of um, approaches to it so that you have contingency just in case something isn't as you expected. So just being able to respond to the unexpected things. And that's one thing, actually, you know, one of our jobs at NASA is we're on boards for other missions that we're not actively working to try to, um, you know, try to help folks learn from things we've learned. And one of the things we found with different missions is anytime we interact with a planet, a new planetary body, there's always surprises involved. There's the, they always throw up something that you didn't expect. So we had that on Phoenix, which is a mission I worked, a Mars lander mission, where we were trying to get material into some ovens to bake it. Yeah. And it was a lot stickier than what we initially suspected. And by the time it wasn't sticky anymore, all the interesting volatiles had already escaped from it. And so there were a lot of issues um, just just digging, you know, simply digging something up and trying to put it inside of an oven on Mars ended up being a lot more difficult than we thought. And just very recently, it was it made quite a bit of press. There was an experiment on the Mars InSight lander called the Mole that was provided by um, a European partner. And that was supposed to dig itself into the surface and it never went more than I think like half a foot or something like that. I mean, it was supposed to go, you know, a couple meters down and they tried all kinds of different things. So anytime you interact with these, these planetary bodies, this, this regolith that we're not familiar with, you got to be ready for as, as a big a range of contingencies as possible if you want to be successful. Cool. Uh, and by the way, I, I put a link into the chat. Uh, if you uh, would like to see some of the other panels today. And then also, um, if you didn't register, you can also uh, watch these uh, on YouTube. Uh, and this video won't be, we probably won't upload this video until Monday, probably. Um, but yesterday's videos are being uploaded now. So uh, if you missed something, you can still see it. Oh, okay. Uh, so here's a good one. So you were, you were talking about... Um, the, the Yorp effect, is that what it, it's called? Yes. So the the, the pressure, yeah, there's yes. a lot of different, yeah. So Yarkovsky effect is just one of many things, yeah. Okay, yeah, the Yarkovsky effect. So uh, someone asks, I thought that photons have no mass and therefore no weight. So That's can right. you please explain further how the pressure from photons can impact the path of an asteroid? Right. So yeah, in, in traditional classical physics, photons don't have any, any mass. But so you think what's the most famous expression probably in science or at least physics? It's E equals MC squared, right? So energy is equivalent to mass. So in fact, the, the fo solar photons, even though they're massless in a classical sense, still impart a, mo a momentum when they hit things. And that's how, you know, solar, so the Planetary Society has the solar sail um, project where they've flown, deployed this big sail in space and they use photon pressure to move around. So it's a small effect, but again, it's constantly happening. As long as there's sunlight falling on you, you're getting hit by photons and that perturbs your orbit. I got uh, a question from Ted Hahn. I haven't heard of static electricity issues with our encounters with asteroids on Mars, but we expect these issues. Um, what uh, can you tell us anything about static electricity in outer space? You know, that's a, 
I don't know much about that. I mean, we pay a lot of attention to, you know, ESD issues when we're building things because we're more worried about interactions between the different things that we build, particularly high voltages. Um, you know, on Mars, we know we are worried about, um, so on, on Bennu, I don't know anything, and I haven't seen anybody on our team really talk about that. So I'm not, I'm not really familiar with what an asteroid kind of electrostatic environment might be. On Mars, I know a little bit more because one of the things for a while we were very interested in studying were the Martian dust storms. Um, and on almost all the recent landers and rovers that we've had, depending on where they land during certain seasons, you'll see these dust devils um, in images. They're, some of them are, are pretty dramatic and they're like you know, little mini, mini tornadoes with, full of dust. And there's a concern there actually that you'll have um, you know, small particles in those dust storms and they're colliding with each other and exchanging charge and that you'll have um, heavier particles tend to be, uh, I believe, negatively charged and then the lighter particles will be positively charged and you'll get a separation then. And at that point, you could have a big um, electrostatic discharge. So there, there was a concern. It's kind of gone down, you know, more recently. Um, but there, for a while, we were very interested in studying just how big of a, a shock you could get, particular, particularly if you were going to have a human crew and what that, what that might do. Um, so, yeah, we haven't really done much of that, of that recently. Um, there has been some work on the moon, actually. If you, there's been some publications that people have, have done that show that it looks like there's a thin layer of dust that is electrostatically levitated in certain areas on the moon. And again, caused by interaction of sunlight with particular material um, on the surface. But yeah, it's not my area of expertise. And like I said, on the asteroid, at least on Bennu, it's nothing that I'd seen anybody um, bring up, but there are interesting, you know, interesting environments like on the moon and, and Mars, which, which make you think about it. Cool. Uh, so what's going to happen to OSIRIS-REx after this mission? Yeah, so once we fly back to the Earth, so that sample return capsule will separate from the main part of the spacecraft. Sample return capsule lands by parachute in Utah. The rest of the spacecraft is supposed to go on a minimum. So if, if we don't get selected to fly to Apophis, the, the idea is you go onto an orbit that has a very low probability of striking anything else for I forget how many thousands of years. So basically try to put it into some kind of orbit that you are not gonna contaminate another surface, um, you know, with stuff from Bennu or stuff we happen to bring from earth. Um, but if we get selected, if headquarters gives us additional funding, we're not gonna take that orbit. We'll actually set up a series of orbits to get to Apophis. And, and I believe right now the orbital trajectory to get to, to Apophis with the lowest amount of fuel usage it involves two Earth flybys. So we'll be bringing OSIRIS-REx close again to Earth if, if in fact we do this Apophis mission. That's and really cool. At that point, you know, it'll be probably, I think we're looking at a minimum of a six month mission to Apophis. And then depending on how much fuel is left, there might be some other follow on mission. Or at that point, again, we might go into one of these orbits that ensures we don't contaminate another planetary body for a few thousand years. Yeah. Well, that's still pretty exciting thinking about a, a spacecraft doing uh, multiple trips to different bodies in our solar system. And I, I don't know, that, that that's really cool to me. That's We are a uh, interplanetary species now, you know, <laughs> that that's just very exciting. Um, All right, so I, I think we're wrapping up with the questions right here. here here's maybe one more is uh, last one. Somebody did ask if Bennu did hit the Earth, uh, would it do less damage because it lost matter? Oh, so we're, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting question. We're not, you know, it's not losing that much material. It's going to take thousands and probably millions of years before you'd even be able um, to, to notice it. But one thing we have actually looked for and we still don't know is because Bennu's orbit obviously crosses our orbit, as you saw in the orbital diagram there. Um, one idea is, are there meteor showers associated with Bennu? Uh, they'd be very weak, because obviously, um, you know, there's not, it's not like some of the other large meteor showers that we have, which are from comets, which are ejecting, you know, a lot more active than what an asteroid would be. But there is currently a program to try to look for that. And we think if there would be one, 
it's sort of in the fall time frame. So they're in, in mainly a southern hemisphere, um, at least for the first, I think, couple of years. So there's actually, and there's, I saw a presentation, there's a, a student at uh, MIT, I think, that is actually look, trying to look into the orbital dynamics of that. Because again, these are very small particles and these are getting perturbed as well. So they're not in sort of a Bennu orbit anymore. They've gone into their own little orbit. And so he's trying to model you know, what the evolution of that trajectory is and when it would happen to hit Earth and then what the kind of the density would be, you know, how, how likely are you, you to be able to see one of these things entering the atmosphere. But that'd be really neat if, you know, there was some minor, minor uh, meteor storm that we could relate to Bennu. That would be, that would be pretty cool. Cool. Uh, going back to Apophis, are there any concerns that Apophis could collide with any Earth satellites, so environmental GPS communication satellites. Yeah, that you know the the odds are low, but it certainly is a is a possibility because it's coming through that whole you know a, a big swarm of material. So it'd be interesting. Like I said, I think there'll be a lot of attention on Apophis in 2029 because it's coming so close, and because there are so many spacecraft that will probably be studying it. It'll be really interesting to see you know what happens to it if it changes its rotation rate. If you know how its orbit gets perturbed, there's a, there's a lot of scientific interest and in, in, you know as well as just mainstream general public interest in that body as well. So I'm sure there'll be at least one NASA mission. There may be multiple ones and probably an ESA and a JAXA mission, I would think as well. So it should be should be interesting when that happens. Cool. And uh, why did we send the return capsule to Earth? instead of sending it to the space station? Why was it easier to send it to Earth? Well, that's good. That's a good question. Um, my kids asked me something similar to that when they were, I think when the mission launched. So the reason it's easier to actually return it to Earth is because we're moving so fast that to get it to the space station, we would have to slow it down in order to get it to that speed. And we don't have enough rocket fuel on board and we didn't design the SRC anyway, but you'd have to take a very large rocket, like kind of, an, you know, you think of the, the sizes of rockets now, they always have this upper stage, um, like a Centaur. You would have to have a huge rocket engine to try to slow it down to the speed of the space station. So it's a lot easier actually to use. So that big white area kind of on the top part of the SRC, that's actually the aero shell. That's why it's shaped that way. And all that white material is the heat ablative material that's going to flake away, that will carry heat away when we enter the atmosphere. So a lot of our energy, a lot of our speed will actually get taken, uh, will actually be slowed down through friction by entering the Earth's atmosphere. And then finally, that little bit of slowing down is all going to come to a parachute that gets deployed after we're pretty far into the atmosphere. So that's the reason why um, you know, it's easier. You think it, you know, something in space bees are just to rendezvous with it, but we're moving so fast that we would need another huge upper stage to slow us down to get us to the speed at which the, the space station orbits. So cool. All right. I think that was our, our last question uh, that we have. Those are some fantastic questions. Uh, it seems like people were really engaged and really interested in uh, in the mission. Uh, so again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Sure, happy to do it. I'm, yeah, those are good questions. It's nice to spend a little bit of time with everybody. All right. Well, uh, hope to see you around Grand Rapids sometime. Best of luck uh, with the upcoming missions. All right, thanks. See All you. Right. Bye everyone, thank you for joining us.